Good morning. Good morning. I love that. I love it. I'm just curious, how many of you have never seen or heard me present before? You'll never be able to say that again. Okay. <laughs> Well, those of you that have, which is very few of you, we have to start out by making this social. Here's our social handles. I'm going to do a selfie here. You guys ready? <laughs> Pretend like you, were, you got a great sleep last night. All right. Let's go here. I'm in the dark. All right. Wave big. Yay. Mexican wave. Mexican wave? What is a Mexican wave? <laughs> what is a Mexican wave? I don't know about that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming this morning, and thank you for setting me up here, Cece. I love that. There are a couple of words that came out so far, what I've heard in the presentations, and one of them is why. We were talking this morning, Rula and I, about why. I want to talk to you about why. So let's think about this. You have a product and you have a brand, right? Some of you, your product is your brand. We're talking about planners and designers and decorators. Your product and your brand. I break that down to your what versus your why. So if you think about what you do, you plan events, you make custom stationery, you take photos, you play music, what you do. Seth Godin, who's a marketing expert, he said the last click before someone buys isn't the moment they made up their mind. So think about what's happened before someone gets to you, before they send you a message, before they call you, email you, WhatsApp you. By the time you get to have a conversation with them, they need what you do. Right? They've already done this. It's called the paradox of choice. We start out looking at every possible choice, and we whittle it down and whittle it down and whittle it down until we get down to the small list. And we heard this yesterday, talking about being on the short list. Right? Right? Once you get down to that short list, they need what you do. Do they need you to do it? And that's the key. They need what you do. They need someone to plan the event, play the music, take the photos, take the videos, create the stationery. They need what you do. But do they need you to do it? Because once they need you to do it, they can't get it from anyone else. How many other companies what looks like yours? Think about it. How many other companies can say they have a great product? Right? Every one of you, right? <laughs> How many of them have great service and great people? So you can't own that. You can't own the fact that you have a great product and great service and great people because there are other people that do that. That's your what. How many other companies why looks like yours? How many other companies do what they do for the same reason that you do what you do? None. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Works better that way. I might have to go to the other clicker. We'll see. I'm trying out the cool ring clicker and see what happens with that. <laughs> well, you do what you do for a different reason. Uh, I think it was Rob that said yesterday he didn't do it for the check, right? He did it for the thank you. And I kind of take it even a little bit further than that. What does it mean to do business specifically with you? What does it mean when someone chooses your company and says to their friends and says to their family, I've chosen you as my planner. I've got, I'm getting my stationery from CC. You're going to take my pictures. You're going to play my music. What does that say to their friends and family? Does it mean anything different? Or is it like, oh, I guess we're going to have music, huh? Right? I guess we're going to have drinks. Right? What does it mean? So. Why do you plan the wedding? Why do you decorate the room? Why do you arrange the flowers? In other words, why do you do your job? Why do you get up in the morning and do your job? Is it for the money? There are some people that do it for the money, but I can tell you in my life, anytime I put the money first, it's never worked out. As a matter of fact, I'm in this industry, we were having this conversation this morning, I'm in this industry because I was in a job that I was making really good money, and I hated it absolutely hated it. I only worked a half a day. You guys know the half a day? You know, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m.? <laughs> well, what? Well, that's 12 hours. That's a half a day, right? I was only working a half a day. I had a company car, fully paid benefits, and I hated my job. And my friend bought a wedding magazine and asked me to come sell for him. And, you know, it seems like a good idea, except let me add to the fact that it was a commission-only job. No salary, no draw, no minimum, no guarantee, no base. Um, I had to get a car because I had a company car, so I had to go get a car. Oh, yeah, my wife was pregnant, and my son was, older son was turning three, and I was the only breadwinner. And, of course, it makes a lot of sense that you would just leave that good-paying job and go do this, right? <laughs> but all they could say to me was, Alan, look how much money you're going to be making. 
And I said, it's not the money. And I meant it. You know, I've heard people say that. As a young man, you know, you, you hear people say it's not the money. You're like, of course it's the money. I want a bigger house. I want a fancier car. I want to live in that neighborhood, right? And then you realize you get the house, you get the car, and it's like, and? <laughs> and I'm working half days, you know? <laughs> and I'm never home. And there's more to life than that. And I learned that lesson at a young age, fortunately, because I'm here now. Do you do it for the satisfaction of a job well done? You know, hey, that was pretty good, you know? You should take satisfaction in what you do. You do it at a high level. You should take satisfaction. But is that why you do it? To satisfy yourself? Do you do it for the thank you? Right? Rob said he did it for the thank you. Oops, come on back. Sorry. Simon Sinek has one of the most watched TED Talks ever. He said, success comes when we wake up every day in the never-ending pursuit of why we do what we do. He's got one of the most wet, watched TED Talks. He talks about the golden circle. The golden circle is the three circles of what, how, and why. Right? What you do. Every organization on the planet knows what they do. These are the products or services that they sell or offer. Music, flowers, photography, planning. Right? That's what you do. How. Some organizations know how they do it. These are the things that make them special or set them apart from their competition. Truth be told, your customers don't care how you do it. They don't, right? They walk into the room and every plate and every charger and every knife and fork is lined up and every glass is clean and they will give zero thought to how that happened. <laughs> Nor should they, because it's supposed to be. So how you do it is up to you. How you make sure they're all lined up, how you make sure they're all there is up to you. That's what they're hiring you for. Very few organizations know why they do what they do. Why is not about making money, that's a result. Why is a purpose, a cause, or belief, it's the very reason your organization exists. So you have to get to your why. You have to get to that, because they needed what you did. They already searched, they went online and they looked on Pinterest or Instagram or Google or, 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 or Guides for Brides, they looked online for what you do. And they've already put you on that short list, so they already think you're a good fit. Your why is what makes you who you are. Every one of you has a unique why, why you do what you do. Your why differentiates you from your competition. Because they do the same what that you do. And it's been said before, a lot of people do it cheaper. <laughs> There's always somebody cheaper. As a matter of fact, when you were new in business, it was probably you. <laughs> right? It was. I, mean, I was at the Knot in the, in the States. I was vice president of sales and I spoke and I spoke for free. Why? Because I was getting paid. I had a salary, I had did that, so I went out and spoke for free. And then I had to compete with myself when I left because now I want you to pay me <laughs> to give the same speech at the same conference and now I want you to pay me, right? So I looked at what other people charged and I charged more. But it wasn't enough more because I was basing my price on them plus. I'm three times, four times what I was back then and I find less price resistance now than I did then. Because if you're doing something at a high level and they see that, they're going to want you. And yes, they know that they have to pay more for that. So let's talk about why. Who hired you? Okay. Who hires you? If you're an employee, who hired you? If you're a business owner, who hired you? It always breaks down to one thing and one word. People. We're always doing business with people. If you're doing corporate work, if you're doing work for companies, you are not doing work for a company you're being hired by a person at that company and they're hiring a person from your company. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. They don't do business with companies. You do business with a person. If that person, I don't care if they're an intern or a receptionist or a CEO, if that person doesn't like you, know you, and trust you, they will find somebody else that they do. Because remember, somebody else gives good service, good products, and good people. This is a quote that I said to the CEO of The Knot. I just heard on the radio the 10 best companies to work for in the United States. I was very excited. I was driving into Manhattan in New York City, and I heard this on the radio, and I went into David's office and I said, David, what are we doing to get on this list? And he said, nothing, nothing. We're not doing anything to get on the list. I said, why wouldn't we want to be on the list of the 10 best companies to work for? He said, well, we're a new company. We're in kind of churn and burn stage, and people come to work for us for a year, year and a half, put us on their resume, go work somewhere else. I said, well, that might work in editorial, but that doesn't work in sales. 
I want my salespeople to be there year after year after year making really good money. And I want them to stay here and be happy and, and, and have relationships with their customers. You know, the very first person I hired in 2000, June of 2000 at the Knot, it's the first person that I hired. I got hired in April because they bought the company I was with. A guy named George, George Proctor. He just celebrated 18 years at the Knot. Right? That's what I wanted. I said, David, we're a company of people doing business with people internally and externally. When I get off the lift at the offices and the receptionist is there, she's my customer and I'm hers. When I walk into the CEO's office, he's my customer and I'm his. And if you treat everyone in your company like a customer, you'll treat them the best that you possibly can and they'll turn around and treat your customers that way as well. So don't focus on tasks. Focus on people. It's always about people. People are going to sit in those chairs. People are going to eat that food. People are going to be in those photos. People are going to hear that music and they're going to dance. People are going to have a great time taking in all the amazing flowers and decoration. It's always about people. It's never about the stuff. People care about outcomes and results. That's what you should be selling. Don't sell stuff. Don't sell music. Don't sell pictures. Don't sell flowers. Don't sell invitations. Right? Sell the outcome. What is it going to mean when someone gets that invitation and opens that envelope and don't you wish you had a camera every time and you could be like, <gasps> see that face? Don't you wish you could see that? Yes. Right? See, the room is empty, which is why you should never show empty pictures in your, in your uh, ads. The room is only empty until the first person comes in. Right? Show it what it's going to look like when the event is actually going on. Last night was amazing. And you should have pictures of that room empty, but that room full, wow. Because we added to it, right? Some of us had our Indian best on. You know. <laughs> That's the second time I wore that Corta. I just want to know. <laughs> yeah. People buy the outcomes and results. Don't sell the stuff. Don't sell them flowers. Sell that wow. Sell that jaw on the ground when they walk in. Sell the experience at the bar, right? when they walk up and they see that drink, and how did you do that color, right? What was happening the other night? Psh, the smoke was coming out there, right? That's what you're selling is the experience. And don't ever forget <coughs> that people are gonna review the outcomes and results. That's what they're gonna do. They review how they felt. They review the experience. They're not reviewing the stuff. They're gonna review how, how they talk about it to their friends. That's the outcomes and results. So let's talk about your why. Who helps you? Who helps you be the best that you can be? Right? Some of us are lucky to have the people sitting next to them. Right? Who is it that helps you do what you do? Who has helped you along the way? Susie and I were talking last night who helped her along the way, right? right? We, we always have people that help us. What does it mean to be part of a team? That was a question that came up before about a team, right? What does it mean to be part of a team? We have a lot of teams going on. You have a team in your company. You have a team in the industry. You have a team in your family. Does your team want to work with you? And your team extends. We're talking about the different people. Do the other wedding and event pros want to work with you? You step into an event and you see that DJ or you see that photographer and do you go, oh, this is going to be a good day, right? It's going to be a good day. Or do you walk in and go, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> really long. <laughs> We've all had that, right? You've all had that. You go in, because some of you control it. If you're the planner and you control who you brought there, you bring those people because you know who those people are. And sometimes you can't control it, right? And you walk in and you're like, oh, make the best of this day. Do they want to work with you, right? You might think that about them, but does anybody think that about you, right? I had somebody call me last year and they said, uh, you're coming in to speak. I said, what type of water would you like us to have for you? I said, excuse me? Um, bottled? I don't know. Still? I don't know. If I, I was in India last week. Not tap water, please. You know? You know, I was in Mexico the week before that. Not tap water, please. But I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. They said, well, do you have a particular brand that you want? I said, no. 
No, bottled, filtered water is fine. I'm, I'm good with that. I want to be low maintenance. I, I've had people say that, Alan, you're, you're probably, you might be our most expensive speaker, but you're also the easiest to work with. I said, good, because if I was the most expensive and the hardest to work with, you wouldn't want to work with me, <laughs> right? I go set up my AV with the guys before, and I'm plugging myself in, doing whatever, got my own clicker, my own stuff there. Why? Because I want to be the easiest to work with. Reduce the friction in the process. I heard that phrase yesterday. Or was that today? I forget. <laughs> How much did we drink last night? <laughs> but if you reduce the friction in the process, people want to work with you because you're easier. Reduce the friction and they're going to do business with you because they know you have it. They know they took care of it. You didn't create these barriers. So let's talk about your why. Who gets in your way? Who stops you from being the best you? Sometimes that person lives in the mirror because it's you. It's you. You put your own barriers up there. I was at the uh, Bride Lux offices yesterday, the Ocean Media offices. I was talking to them about that, that type of stuff. You get in your own way. You define your own success, and you can also sabotage your own success getting in your own way. <laughs> so the way you treat your team is where they're going to treat your customers. If you don't treat your team well, they're not going to treat your customers well, and you're getting in the way, and they're getting in the way. You know what they say, if you're, you want to see how somebody really is, take them out for a meal and see how they treat the waiter or waitress. Yeah, they might be really nice to you. And if they're mean to the waiter or waitress, that's who they really are. Because that's your true self. You know, you want to see them being polite and kind and helpful and, 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 and being service oriented because that's what we have to be. We're in the service business. That's what we do. We provide service for people. So you have to lead by example. Anybody here have kids? Do they see everything you do? Yeah. yeah. You can't be like this. Listen, kids, don't smoke. It's really bad for you. You can't do that because they see what you do. Oh, and they hear what you do too, right? And they will repeat it at just the wrong time. <laughs> but you have to lead by example. You see that. I always said that I know that I treat my wife well if I watch my sons with their girlfriends. If they treat them well, if they, if they hold the door for them, if they buy them flowers, it means that's what they saw. My dad is 88. My mom's turning 85 next month. When I call down to Florida, I talk to my dad. He doesn't say you want to talk to mom. He says, would you like to speak to the lovely lady? Aww. Yeah. Every morning when I'm away, I email my wife or I text my wife, good morning, gorgeous. Right? Hope you have a great day. Hope you slept well. You know, Every morning. Why? because that's what I saw, right? My wife's wedding bouquet, the main flower was a stargazer lily. And when I want to buy my wife flowers, sometimes I just buy her flowers because it's Tuesday. But sometimes I buy her stargazer lilies. My son was out with his girlfriend. It was their third or fourth anniversary. And my wife said, send us pictures. You know, you can be all dressed up. Send us pictures. So he sends pictures over and they're all dressed up. And there's Lena holding a bouquet of stargazer lilies, Aww. right? You lead by example in your life, you lead by example in your team, and people see what you do. I would, I would be vice president of sales at The Knot, and I'd go to a trade show, and I'd start setting up the booth, and my team was like, you don't have to do that, Alan. I was like, yeah, I know, but it needs to get done, so let's do it, right? There's nothing below you, right? You will do every job, so therefore they will do every job. What's best for, best for the customer is best for the company. You have to think big picture. You have to think in terms of the big picture. Don't think in terms of the minutia. What's the big picture? What's the long-term value of the relationship? Right? It was mentioned yesterday. I'm sure it was mentioned uh, today as well. It'll be mentioned even more. How many customers are you doing business with again and again and again? And how many people were at that event that you did that now do business with you? So we're auditioning every time. Everything you do. Now, I don't do it as an audition. This is not an audition for my next speech. It just is an audition because somebody here might say, oh, I know a speaker for you, and here you go. So you're always auditioning, which means you always have to be giving your best, which you should be, because you're leading by example, thinking of a long-term relationship. Right? I don't want this to be the, the, the first and last time that I speak for Bride Lux. Right? It's the first. It's, is it the last? That's not up to me. That's up to somebody else. I love this quote, Mika Solomon said in Forbes, the answer is yes. What was the question? <laughs> Isn't that a great attitude? Isn't that the attitude that you would want if you were the customer that somebody says yes? What was the question? I, right, I can help you with that. 
I created a new customer service team when, when I was at The Knot because the old customer service team was about efficiency because we had a CE, COO that was all about efficiency. It was, she was checking boxes. How many, how many pieces of artwork did we process today and how, many, how much money did we collect today and how many customers did we sign up today? That's what it was, efficiency. Efficiency leaves people out of the process because you're looking at paper and numbers. So I wasn't in charge of customer service, but for some reason I came up with this idea. I said, well, what if we did it differently? What if we put the customers first and then we'll be efficient, but we'll have happy customers? You want to stop customers from canceling? Don't stop them when they say they want to cancel. Stop them from ever wanting to cancel, right? That's, that was my idea. So I said, what if you called up and I said, hi, thanks for calling the knot. My name is Alan and I can help you. I can help you. Not can I help you. You called, which means you need something. I can help you. I want to help you. I will help you right now. Smiling. <laughs> Wouldn't that be better? And that if 80% of what you needed I could fix and the other 20% I knew who could and I'll get you the answer and I will get back to you. Because I asked my team, I said, how many times would you like to be put on hold when you call? They said, well, never. I said, how many times would you like to be transferred? They said, well, never. I said, good, that's what we're going to do. And they said, well, how do we do that? I said, we're going to figure that out, but that's what we're going to do. The answer is yes. Now, what's the question? So let's talk about your why. Who hears you? Right? Everybody. Everybody hears you. I hate when I'm in a restaurant and I hear waiters and waitresses complaining about something. Management, something, whatever's going on. They should never hear that. Right? Listen, it's life. There's things to complain about. Should never be in earshot of the customers, right? What does great customer service sound like? What does it sound like? I think it sounds like happy people, happy to hear from you, right? Thanks for calling the knot. My name's Alan, and I can help you, right? That's what it sounds like. I was relating a story last night. Um, I forget who it was to now. It could have been to Boris. Um, I was in Las Vegas for a convention. We were driving from the hotel to the convention center. And we pulled into a McDonald's because I wanted to get something to drink. Four of us in the car, nobody else wanted anything. Pull in, now what's your expectation at the drive through at McDonald's? Where's the bar? Is it here? <laughs> I think it's here, right? So we pull up and a, a pleasant voice comes across the speaker and says, Welcome McDonald's, can I take your order? Well, that was a good start. Okay. And I said, yes, I'd like a large Diet Coke with two pieces of lemon, please. And she said, will that be all? I said, yes. She goes, that's a dollar eight. Pull around, love. <laughs> I said to the people in the car, did she say pull around love? And they said, we think so, but we don't have a rewind button. You know, we're so accused to rewind, right, on TV, we can rewind. Okay, so we pull around, and there's this girl, young girl, smile on her face, and she said, Diet Coke? I said, yeah. She goes, that's a dollar eight. How's your day going? <laughs> I'm at McDonald's <laughs> at the drive through How's my, I said, my day's going great. How's your day going? She goes, my day is great. Thanks for asking. I give her the money. She gives me the change. She goes, you have a great rest of your day. Just like that. And I said, with that smile on your face, I will. Thank you. And we pulled up to the next window and I got my drink and I got the receipt. And on the bottom of the receipt, it's a telephone number. Who calls that phone number? Happy people? <laughs> Not usually, right? I said, what was her name? And they said, Brianna. I said, great. So from the two blocks that it was from where we were to the convention center, we called on the, on the Bluetooth in the car. And I called up and I said, I just have to tell you, at the, at the McDonald's on Paradise in Las Vegas, a young lady named Brianna just gave us the absolute best service. What a great attitude. She is a credit to your organization. And there was silence on the other end. <laughs> there, there was this silence and <laughs> this woman was like, She said, um, thank you for calling. <laughs> you can imagine we don't get too many calls like this. And I said, well, if you had more people like Brianna, you would. A dollar eight. It was a dollar eight, and I'm telling you, and I've been telling people in every country I've been in, what great customer service sounds like is Brianna. A dollar eight. I bet you Brianna has a better day at work than most of her coworkers. So the next day, had to back, back to the convention center, in the car, same people in the car, drive through McDonald's. I wasn't even thirsty. <laughs> Pull up to the speaker, and a man's voice came across. 
And he was nice. I have to say, he was nice. And he, and he did what he was supposed to do. But he wasn't Brianna. <laughs> he was better than most, but he wasn't Brianna. Right? I wasn't thirsty and I went back because the experience was there. And it doesn't matter where it is because I've had the opposite. I remember my wife uh, had to return something at the grocery store and then we had a, a rain check for something. So we go and return at the customer service and the woman said everything she was supposed to say. She read the words of the script except the way she said it made us feel like we were interrupting her life. <laughs> you ever had one of those people? Not her day, her life. And I'm listening going, she's saying what she's supposed to say. Why do we feel like we're, we're the bad people here? And we got the change and we walked away like, what just happened? <laughs> so we tried to shake it off and we went to the shelf. We had a rain check for an item that they had been out of that was on special. So we go to the shelf. We have three we can buy with this rain check, but there's only two. So we take the two and we go up to the cashier and we say, listen, we have a rain check for three. There's only two on the shelf. Could you please mark that we took two? We'll come back and get one. She said, no. And? Just no? I said, well, why not? She said, well, I have to take that rain check. I said, well, okay, that's fine. Just give us another one for the one. We'll come back for the other. I can't do that. Really? Why not? She said, well, that sale isn't on now. I said, but you don't have the items. If you had the item, I would take them. If I was only trying to take two when you had, I said, this is crazy. You, you, you have to be able to do this. She said, well, I can't. I said, well, is there someone you could ask? <laughs> she said, well, you know, body language. She goes, do I feel like she wants to help me now? I guess I could ask my manager. So my mother taught me to, you know, you catch more flies with honey. I said, could you please? <laughs> so she picks up the phone and she calls over to you know, whoever. And guess who comes over? Smiley from customer service. <laughs> comes over. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be a good day now, right? Because we just had Smiley over there. And they're talking. You know when people are talking like you're not there? <laughs> they're right here. They're talking like you're not there. And they're going back and forth. And I said, yeah, no, she already told me. She has to take this. I get that. You just give us a rain check for the one. We'll come back. She said, well, I can't do that. I said, this is crazy. Because now I'm digging in, right? Now I'm like, <laughs> I, I, it could have been 40 cents. It doesn't matter. I'm, it's principle now, right? I said, you have to be, I, there has to be someone I can ask. She goes, well, I can, guess you could ask at customer service. Weren't you just there? <laughs> I thought there was going to be like the movies. You know when you go to the movies, you see the movies, right? So they open the window and it's a person. They say, sorry, next window. They close it, you go and it's the same person, <laughs> right? I thought that's what we're going to be getting here. <laughs> so we go and there's someone else there and I'm telling her the story and we're getting the same answer there. And I, I, this is just principle now. And I said, this is crazy. There has to be someone you can ask. She said, well, I guess I could ask the department manager. And I said, could you please? <laughs> She gets on her radio and she says, well, Bill, you know, this is Susan at customer service. And then she's going through the whole story. And she goes through the whole story and across the, the, the radio comes four letters. Bill said, do it. Do it. Do it. Give them the rain check. Just give them. Do it. 20 minutes it took us to get to do it. And we didn't shop in that store for six months. What does great customer service sound like? Happy people who want to help you. Brianna wanted to help me. Not so much in the grocery store. <laughs> you have, may have said something a thousand times, but the person in front of you is hearing it for the first time. You have to remember that you can't just be reciting a script. You have to say these things to this person like it's the first time you've ever said it, with that emotion that you're happy to be telling them because they didn't hear the other 999 times. They have to hear that. I have a pet peeve with the phrase, no problem. No problem. No problem for doing my job is what I hear every time somebody says that. Why is it that I go into the store, like I went down to Boots down the, down the road, and I picked up something, I helped myself, <laughs> and I went up to the cashier, if you don't go to the automatic one that you can check yourself out, right? You go to the cashier, you give them the item, they might look at you, they might smile at you, they might acknowledge you, they might not. You give them the money, they give you the change, and you say to them, thank you. Wait, I just helped myself. <laughs> and I gave you money, and I said thank you. And they say, no problem. 
Really? That was no problem for you. <laughs> that, 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 that was no problem. Thank you for the effort. That was no problem. <clears throat> There's a fast food place in the States called Chick-fil-A. I don't know if it's made it over here yet. Has it made it here yet? No, okay. Chick-fil-A, you could have a 16-year-old kid helping you, and you go back for your refill of your drink, your free refill, and you say, excuse me, can I get a refill of my iced tea? It's my pleasure. And they smile. Whatever you ask them, they look at you and say, it would be my pleasure. 16-year-olds, 26, 36, 56, they're going to look at you and say, it's my pleasure. I go there partly for that. I do. Chicken's good. And they have waffle fries. If you like waffle fries, I'm telling you. Yeah. I go in there every time and say to myself, don't get the waffle fries. Don't get the waffle fries. Don't get the waffle fries. Small waffle fries. I'll get a small waffle fries. But I love the fact I'm waiting for it. And every time, every time they give it, every day, I'll say thank you. And they go, it's my pleasure. And they look at you and they smile when they say that. That changes the experience. And I will go there instead of someplace else that might have better chicken because of that experience. What if they said, you're very welcome, and said it with a smile? So when I hear no problem, and believe me, there are times when no problem is appropriate. You know, you know would, it, would it be possible to do that? No, that would be no problem at all. That's fine. But when you're doing your job, <laughs> it shouldn't be no problem. It should be your pleasure because we're in an industry that people are spending billions of dollars that they don't have to spend. I said this the other day at a conference. You need a license and someone who can legally perform a ceremony to get married. Right? You don't have to spend any money on a party. There is no law that says you need to spend money on a party or invitations or flowers or photos or music or food or, or, or dresses. There is no law that says you have to have it. And yet, people spend billions and billions of dollars every year on that. And we should say, thank you, not no problem. <laughs> right? And we should say it with a smile. My best friend's son, he lived in Brooklyn, New York, called me up, he got engaged, and he said, Alan, how much does it cost to get married? I said, well, you live in Brooklyn, New York, so I'm going to go with about $100. And he said, you mean $100 a person? I said, no, I made about $100. I said, with the Uber to City Hall and the license, it's about $100, I, right? Wouldn't you say in New York? I would think so. I said, that, that's what it costs to get married. And then if you decide to throw a party, it costs whatever you want it to cost. And I said, if you want to do pizza and beer, we would be honored to celebrate your one and only ever marriage, because that's what we all hope for, right? My parents, 64 years, right? My wife and I, 35 years. Right? I said, we don't believe in divorce. We believe in murder. <laughs> and if she wants me out of the house, it's not just out of the house. And with my traveling, I've, I've flown almost 100,000 miles this year. She could pull this off for years. Oh, you just missed him. He's in India. No, no, no. Listen, if she didn't need the insurance money, she would be able to pull that off. That is my saving grace. She, she could knock me off tomorrow. You wouldn't know for years, but she'd run out of money. So there you go. Okay. So do you understand your why? Do you understand why you do what you do? And does your team understand your why? And do you understand their why? Do you understand why that waiter, that waitress, that bus person, that person that's arranging flowers, that person that's editing photos, that person that's helping you deliver the cake, do you, un do you understand their why? They might be doing it for the paycheck. They might. Not, not anything wrong with that. We all need to pay the bills. I get that. But if that's the only reason they're doing it, <clears throat> is it enough? So let's talk about expressing your why. How do you get across what your why is? Most of what we communicate is nonverbal, right? So who would you rather, who would you rather meet? <coughs> Them? Or her? <laughs> I think we've all met her, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I met her the other day. Yeah. <laughs> right, who would you rather meet? I remember going on a flight one time and going there, the two flight attendants, I'll call them grumpy and grumpier. Have you met them? <laughs> yeah. And then coming back, I had like smiley and happy. It was the same trip, but going there, you know, getting on the plane, they're like barking at you to get to your seat and get your stuff in there. And then coming back, it was like, hey, welcome, thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Look, can I help you find your seat? Same trip takes the same amount of time. And yet, what's the difference? It's all about people. It's all about body language. 
When our, our girl at the, uh, at the grocery store went like this, <sighs> already I know whatever happens after that is not going to be good, <laughs> right? Because your body language says it. Your body language says it. How, how you're looking at people. Oh, by the way, if you're meeting with a gaggle, you know, where if you meet with like not just a, a bride or a groom or a bride and a bride or a groom and a groom, but you get the whole posse, right? <laughs> if you want to know who the decision maker is, watch the eyes. Ask the bride or the groom or a groom, whatever it is, ask who you think is the decision maker a question and who do they look at, mm -hmm. right? Do they look at their significant other? Do they look at their mom, their dad, their sister, their aunt? Who do they look at? You will find the decision maker. Because if every time you look, they're looking over there, what do you think? And they're looking, what do you think? You'll find the decision maker. Body language doesn't lie. <laughs> Does your body language match your words? When we went to customer service, her body language did not match her words. She said what she was supposed to say. She had the script. But her body language, her, her aura, her energy, you know, I don't know if you believe that I do, but the energy was like, woo! <laughs> right? Does it matter if you smile? If you're on the telephone with someone, can you tell if they're smiling? Yes. Yeah. If you're on the phone with someone, can you tell if they're paying attention? Yes. Can you tell if they're reading their email? Yes. Have you ever been reading your email while you're on the phone with someone? Yes. They can tell too. <laughs> <laughs> My wife loves to call me out on that. You know, we're on the phone a lot because I travel and, and she'll be like, what are you doing right now? And usually she's right, but sometimes I'm just listening. And I realized that I have to make noises. I can't just listen. I have to make noises. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because otherwise she thinks I'm just not paying attention. <laughs> but you can tell if someone's smiling. It does make a difference. Right? I, it's part of my speaking is I always want people smiling because I want you having a good time because you chose to spend this time with me and you could be doing something else. So if you make eye contact, smile. You couldn't help it, could you? I saw. <laughs> you can't. If you genuinely smile at someone, they can't help it. They're going to smile back at you. Endorphins get released, and they're going to feel better about the interaction. There's something called the 10-foot rule. Whenever an employee comes within 10 feet of a customer, the employee greets the person with a cheerful hello or simply makes eye contact, smiles, and nods his or her head. And I spend a lot of time in hotels, and I'll, I smile at just about everybody. I make eye contact, and I hate when they do this. <laughs> just smile. Any of you ever work for Marriott? Right, then you know this one, you know the 15-5 rule, right? Within 15 feet of the Marriott employee, the worker should acknowledge the visitor's presence, usually with eye contact, a friendly nod, or some other gesture. Within five feet, the employee should smile and say hello. I test this one all the time because I'm a Marriott Platinum. <laughs> I make eye contact with every employee. <laughs> Just smile back, that's it. I know your rule, I got it. Five feet, you better say hello. <laughs> but they go on to say, employees must apply it to each other as well as those they serve. Everyone who visits the hotel is an external guest, employees are internal guests, and they must treat each other with the same courtesy. So an interesting thing, you've seen your coworker 10 times today. Customer comes in. You see that same coworker for the 11th time. Smile and greet them because they didn't see the other 10 times that you saw them. They'll see you ignoring each other. They'll see you not making the eye contact. They'll see you not smiling, and they'll think that's your relationship instead of, hi, hi, hi. That's it, just, hi. Just look at each other, hi, smile, acknowledge, that's it. Remember, they see everything. They notice everything. They're paying attention to the body language, your body language with each other. So will anyone notice if you don't do your job in this day and age? Will they notice if you don't do your job? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> they will definitely notice. But see, there's doing our job and then there's doing our craft, right? Do you work the same when no one's watching? This is an interesting one. I was, I was doing at a country club, I was doing a private training because I do training for venues and, and, and things like that, hotels. And I said to the guy that was mowing the lawn on the golf course, I said, when the groundskeeper's supervisor is there in his little golf cart watching you, and when he's not, do you mow the lawn the same way? Do you rake the trap the same way when the supervisor can see you as when not? I said, because if you do, then you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it for the guests. You're doing it for the golfers that are going to come, right? Do you, do you set up the table the same way, whether the boss is there or not? I, I was asking Boris last night, because he's the 
the, the manager there, the food and beverage manager. And, and I noticed him watching his staff, you know, because he's now a guest. But I noticed him watching them. And I was wondering, do they do what they do the same when he's not in the room? Because if they do, then they're doing it for the right reason. If they do it differently when he's watching and they step up their game, well, why wouldn't you step up the game when he, he's not there? It's not for him. It's for the guests. Whether they see you or not, every job matters. See, we work with a lot of people to make things happen that our customers will never, ever see. They don't see the people setting up the room. They don't see the people breaking down the room. They don't see them setting up the marquees. They don't see them editing photos. They don't see them mixing batter, right, and icing cakes and designing. They don't see a lot of that. A reminder of when my boys were little and our living room window looked out on the front of the house and my boys were up on the, the sofa looking out the window when the garbage truck came by to pick up the trash. And my boys were little and they were like, ew, smelly garbage truck, smelly garbage truck. And I said, hey guys, uh, what happens if they decide not to come anymore? And boys were little and they didn't understand. Like, well, what? I said, what happens if the truck decides not to come? We put the garbage out by the curb and they don't come. Uh, what do you mean? I said, where's the garbage now? And they said, it's here. I said, and what if they don't come next week? Where's the garbage now? They said, it's here. I said, right. And where is it smelly now? They said, here. I said, right. So instead of saying, you know, ooh, smelly garbage truck, is that an important job that they come by and pick that up? They said, well, yeah. I said, well, instead of going smelly garbage truck, why don't you wave and say thank you? Because every job matters. It, it only mat it, you're only going to notice when it doesn't get done, right? And if I walk in and there's no <laughs> chair to sit on, I'll notice that. But I walked in and it was there. I remember being in the Marriott Hotel in uh, Philadelphia, the National Speakers Association Conference, 1,500 people. I happened to be in the main ballroom when they were changing it from 1,500 theater style to 1,500 banquet rounds, all right? And they had to do that while we went into breakout sessions and come back for lunch. And I'm watching this army, and you guys know what it looks like, right? They're rolling in tables, they're rolling in chairs, they're doing all that stuff. 1,500 people left that room, went into breakout sessions, came back, sat down for lunch, and gave zero thought to how that happened. Because it was supposed to be that way. And nobody thought about it. Nobody thought about, well, wait a minute. That table wasn't here. <laughs> These linens weren't here. These forks and knives and, and glasses weren't here. They gave no thought to it because it was supposed to be that way. But it mattered, didn't it? Because if it wasn't right, <laughs> they would notice. Every time you interact with a customer or a guest, you represent your entire company. You're the only person that they see. You represent the entire company. If you're a company of one, great. If you're a company of five, but you're the one that's emailing the customer, speaking to the customer, interacting in an event with the customer, you are the company because that's all they see. I liked that McDonald's because of Brianna, right? She represented that McDonald's. Now, I don't know if her manager has everybody they hire like that, but my impression was, these must be nice people here. And at the grocery store, not so much. <laughs> so let's talk about your why. Who hears you? This phrase, ooh. I had about 100 people working with me when I was at The Knot. Vice President of Sales, Sales Director, Sales People, Customer Service, Count Collection, Art Collection, different people. I said to my team, if I ever hear any of you say this phrase, you're right, because you don't work here anymore. <laughs> there is nothing that's not your job. If a customer asks you a question, it's your job to get them the answer. Maybe it's not your job to do what needs to be done, but it is your job to get to the answer. There is nothing below you or above you. Everything, if you speak to a customer, it's your job. So if you ever say it's not my job, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy on my team. <laughs> You got to work it like you own it. You do. Best compliment I ever got, I was a young man. I was installing burglar alarm systems because I couldn't get a job in advertising because <laughs> that's what you do with a magna cum laude degree in advertising. You install burglar alarms. Yeah. <laughs> and my boss said to me, he said, you know, you're the kind of person that'll never get fired because you just work it like it's your company. And I, I never thought about it. I just did, which means I must have, my dad must have been like that or whatever. That's what I saw but work it like you own it. People that were on my team that asked me to be promoted to be a sales director rarely got that job. 
the people that got it were the ones that acted like it without asking. I got promoted to vice president when my boss left and they said there was no search. When he said he was leaving, we said it's going to be Alan. I never asked for the job. I must have acted like it. I must have had that responsibility already. And they said, well, you're just the natural one for it. Because <laughs> saying you want it doesn't get it. Doing what you need to do, showing who you are, is what's going to get it. So are you working a job or applying a craft? Right? There's a line between those two things. You're going to get it done either way, but applying a craft comes from a different place. We were selling a house. You know how the carpeting sometimes gets a little loose, right? It gets a little wavy. And we needed to get it stretched. So I asked around, and I said, can anybody recommend a carpet stretcher? And my neighbor said, I have a guy. He's great. He's great. He's a carpet stretcher, right? What am I thinking? He's stretching the carpet, right? That's it. It's a job. Not for him. This guy came in, and he did his work. I had to stop and watch him. The way he was paying attention, I had to stop and watch him. I actually sat and watched this guy stretching carpet. And then when he was done, at least I thought he was done, he put his face down and he's looking and he started over. I thought he was done. Looked good to me. I, I wasn't wavy as far as I was concerned. He started over because he was playing a craft. The craft, whatever it is, that craft of that. I say the difference between you know, me and, and a lot of other people that speak at conferences, I don't have another job. <laughs> this is my job. So I work on the craft of speaking. That's the goal, is, is to be a better speaker and then have the subject matter expertise as well because I want to be a better speaker. That's a craft for me. It's not a job. So you're investing in yourself. Right? What do you do? What is, somebody here, tell me, what do you do? <laughs> I was going to say when you're not working your regular job. <laughs> what do you do <laughs> besides your craft of work? What do you do outside? What hobby? What do you, what do you have? Somebody. Dance, you dance. Okay, what do you love about dancing? It takes me to a whole other place where I can just forget about everything else and I'll recharge my mind. It takes you to another place, you can forget about everything, reach out of it. What about <laughs> dancing do you bring into your work? So, uh, I want to try and offer an add-on to um, someone else that does dance lessons um, for couples. So you offer, dan you offer dance lessons to the couples? Yeah, so I want to be doing that. So. You want to be doing that. But what about dancing? What, what is your regular, why you, what, what do you do here? You're a planner? You're, uh, yeah, I'm a wedding planner. Okay, so what about dancing do you bring into your planning? Not actually dancing itself, but what is it about dancing? What, is, what do you do in dancing that you say, gee, that influences what I do in my work? Maybe being creative. Maybe, a little pun here, thinking on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of dancing you're doing, but thinking on your toes, right? But the ability to, you know, when you're following a partner, right? Yeah. What, what does it mean to dance with someone else, right? That's being part of a team, right? What else? What does somebody else do? Hobby? Anybody? What do you do? Um, take the kids camping. Take the kids camping. What do you love about that? Um, I would say, obviously, getting out of town, having an authentic experience. Out of town, authentic experience. And um, being, being present. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say that. Oh. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's the right word. Getting out of, the, out, of, out of town and being present with your, with your children. Being present is hugely important. Right? It's hard to be present. It is, because our brains can't do that. Our brains want to think about other stuff. I learned how to be present when I started doing martial arts. I started Taekwondo when I was 39. And if I was sparring with someone, I'll say, if we were sparring, and I'm thinking about that email I need to send, <laughs> you're going to hit me. Matter of fact, you're supposed to hit me. That is the whole idea of sparring. Right? I cannot be thinking about the email. I have to think about what's in front of me. And that taught me how to think about what's in front of me in other ways and pay attention in other ways and show everybody that they're important in other ways because I'm giving them the most important gift you can give anyone is your time. That's what it is, whether it's your children, whether it's people that work with you, whether it's your customers, is giving them your time and showing them that they're valued. It's great. Love it. What else? Anybody else? Anybody else want to share? Yeah. I volunteer my time for a nonprofit. Um, <coughs> they grant wishes to um, couples in need, life threatening, wow. life altering circumstances. So it's an extension of my job. But the thing that I take away from the volunteering is the level of gratitude that somebody who has not has actual problems in life, it makes our problems look like the real problems. Okay. Right. Sorry. So you're volunteering for people that have genuine problems. Um, not first world problems, but genuine problems, <laughs> life-threatening problems, and the gratitude that they have that you're giving them 
your time, given your attention. Or the gratitude that you learn to practice when you see how much light, sunshine, joy these people, these people are sick. Like, yeah, like, and I mean, these are, these are, these are, these are right, health issues. And they have health issues, and the level of generosity that somebody with those kinds of issues can have, and the joy and the light that they bring into other people's lives despite having those issues, <coughs> you don't have one single day you complain about, I'm sorry, my whatever is ruining my life. There's a great phrase, when you're healthy, you have 100 problems, when you're not, you have one, mm -hmm. right? And just to be able to give that gift to people who are having that one problem <laughs> makes you appreciate what else you have, right? Yeah, I've, I've had health issues and I can tell you it's true. When you're not healthy, you have one. And when you are, I wish you all first world problems, right? I wrote an article about that. The first line of the article, I wish you all first world problems, is the battery on my iPhone dies faster when I wear my Apple Watch. <laughs> that is a first world problem. I, you don't hear that in the third world. You know, my Apple Watch, it's just, um, you know. Your why is delivering more than they expect. Right? We always talk about over-delivering and over-delivering, but that's really what it is. Doing that extra thing, that extra little design. I have a customer who's a wedding band, right? They're a wedding band. And yet his gift is he finds something that the couple is into, whatever it is that they like, something about them, and he gives them something that their guests can sign. It could be bowling pins, like there's bowling alley here. He had one couple they met at the bowling alley. He brought bowling pins for their guests to sign. Another couple loved to travel, so he brought them a hard side suitcase for the guests to sign. Another one, it was a cash register. Another one, it was a, a movie poster, because they love when Harry met Sally, so he had someone make a poster, but with their faces on it instead, and had all of their wedding party as the, as the cast, and their guests sign that. And he's the wedding band. <laughs> But he loves doing this because it's his passion to give that extra gift. See, our customers deserve and expect good service and a good product and a good attitude. They expect your full attention, right? They expect it. We hope they give it to them, but they expect it. They expect a smile and a thank you. We should because, again, we're in a business that they don't have to do this right? and they don't have to hire us. So they should get a thank you and a smile. They don't expect it to be exceptional, or do they? Do they expect it to be exceptional? See, I don't know what exceptional means to them because you have to have their point of reference. And that's thing, something you have to understand is your customer has their own unique set of experiences that you've never had. I remember being at a steakhouse one time in Omaha, Nebraska with all the C-level executives at the Knots. You know, it's everybody with a C. CEO, CFO, COO, C, whatever. I always said I wanted the title C. If the, clearly, it's the person who makes the most money is the C, whatever that is, right? Maybe the CC, I don't know, either, either way. Yeah, either way. But, and the waiter comes over and he's telling us about this beef and it's the top 5% of beef in the United States. It's vacuum sealed at the farm after they slaughter the cow and how well they took care of the cow. I'm thinking right before you killed it, I know, but okay. But you vacuum sealed it and you brought it over and it's not gonna be opened until you order it. And then he said, this is gonna be the best steak you've ever had. And I'm looking around the table going, those three people have eaten Kobe beef in Japan and you just told them this is going to be the best steak they've ever had. You don't know your audience, buddy, right? It was a good steak. I don't know if it was the best steak they ever had. I don't think it was the best I've ever had. It was good, but it was also freezing cold in the restaurant, so cold I had to put my coat on halfway through dinner, so the experience of it, I don't care how good that steak was, I wasn't having a good time. But the best steak you've ever had when you don't know your audience? Mm, don't make that promise. You have to surprise and delight. You have to give them more. Had a conversation at the offices yesterday and it was uh, someone who said they sold a, a stand at one of the expos to someone and two weeks before she wanted to cancel. And it, it, she can't, it's too close, cancellation policy. And she said, I know she's gonna show up and be miserable and therefore do poorly at the show because her body language, everything is gonna be miserable. She said, how can I tell her when she's being miserable to not be miserable because you're, you know, it's gonna hurt you? I said, well, why don't you stop her from being miserable? She said, well, I can't give her a refund. I said, no. I said, why don't you go to her and give her something at the beginning? We ended up coming up with, give her a bottle of champagne. Walk over to her at the beginning, give her a bottle of champagne and say, listen, 
I know that you had tried to cancel, and I'm you know, sorry we couldn't work that out, but it's going to be a great day, and I wanted you to be able to celebrate properly with all the business you're doing here. So take this bottle of champagne and put it aside, and later today you get to pop that open and celebrate, okay? But don't, sh don't tell anybody. Right? Change the paradigm. Surprise and delight. Have her smiling at the beginning thinking, I got a bottle of champagne later. <laughs> Instead of, I don't want to be here, right? How can you find a way to say yes to the customer every time? It's tough, but nobody wants to hear no. Sometimes you can't do what they want, but instead of saying, no, I can't do that, say, I love this, Cece, what if? <coughs> what if we did this? Instead of saying no, say, what if we did this? It's exactly, give them another alternative. And sometimes it's better, what well, you're doing, it's always better, but with, sometimes it's better than what they were asking for. Like, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> If your customer says, that's exactly what I was looking for, you are delivering on what somebody else can give them. If your customer is saying, I never thought of that, you're delivering something no one else can give them. There's a book called The Challenger Sale, right? Challenge your customer on what their expectations are and elevate them to something that no one else is suggesting, and then they have to get it from you. So you're getting it right every time? We hope so, right? Can you be better? Can you be a better employer, employee, husband, wife, son, daughter, brother, sister, father, mother? Yeah. This is my philosophy. I don't ever want to be the best I can ever be. I just want to be the best I've ever been every time. I don't want this to be the best speech I can ever give. I would like it to be the best I've ever given, but not the best I can ever give. And this is the best speech I can ever give. I'm going to drop the mic, walk off the stage, you'll never see me again. Because if I know I can't be better, I'm done. What keeps me going is the fact that I can be better. When I watch another speaker and I go, that was good. Yeah, I want to be that good, right? That's what I watch for. That's what the craft is. What are they doing so well? Or, what did, mm, why did they do that? Like I had one speaker and, and she stood back here, you know? And I said to her, you know, your body language said to the audience, I don't want to be near you. If you notice me, I'm precariously on the ledge all the time. <laughs> that's just where I am. I have to be here. And when I'm done, that's when I'll step away. Because I want to be here. Yeah, I'm watching. I see it. <laughs> These wires are a little, little tough over here, though. And I saw you got caught. My heels. I don't have heels on, no. They make my legs look better, but I don't, you know. There you go. So I want to be the best every time because I want to be better than I was the last time. I learned that in martial arts too. And just remember this, you don't always get credit for getting it right, but you will lose points for getting it wrong. Okay. No one ever walks into your room with a crystal chandelier and says, every light bulb is working. <laughs> That's never been said. No, but one is out, oh, you're gonna hear it, right? right? One napkin's a little off, one fork is a little off, a little fingerprint on a glass, you will hear that because it was supposed to be right. They're, they're right to tell you that. It was supposed to be right. You don't get credit for getting it right. That's what they're hiring you for. That's why they chose you. You will lose points for getting it wrong. Your customers define your brand with their words, <coughs> which means your customers define your why with their words. If you want to find your why, here's where you find it. Right? Do they notice your attention to detail? Do you think they do? Some people do, some people don't. But here's how you know. Right? Where's Siobhan? Siobhan's here somewhere. No, she's not. No, she's not? Shh. Tell her we talked about her. Okay. I went online and I searched a bunch of the speakers. I wanted to find your why. Siobhan was instrumental in making our big day a day to remember. From the moment we met, she totally got us and our vision. It speaks volumes that almost a decade on, we're still in touch. I can't recommend Siobhan highly enough, right? How about uh, Elizabeth? The stunning cake got plenty of wows from the guests when they saw it, but the best was yet to come. Every tier was a different flavor sponge with exquisite fillings, was absolutely and insanely delicious. Best cake we've ever tasted. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a why, all right? Cece, where do I even begin? I had been following C.C. Johnson for quite a while, so once I was engaged, they were actually the first team I reached out to. I actually did not even consider the other very talented artists out there, 
And there absolutely are many talented people out there. However, I can honestly say that no one else's work really compares to what Cece and her team are doing. That's a why. They're not saying that about other people. That's what makes it unique. All right? Uh, wed me good. Is wed me good here? So for my sister's wedding in Jaipur at Fairmont, we hired a wedding design company to handle everything. Loved every moment, and WDC did their best with their fancy and amazing setup who brought Mika and Chedas and all other artists live. I don't think we've wanted anything more happening for my sister and Jiju for living up to their wedding dream. Are they talking about the stuff? No. They're talking about the experience. They're talking about the people. So how are you going to bring your why to your customers tomorrow and every day? Thanks so much for listening. I have an employee that I, um, I, when I critique her or ask her to basically do better, she's like, I'm doing the best I can. How do you handle that? Okay, it's about the direction. I want to do better is too vague, right? So what I would do is I would be more specific and give her direction. So I do. Okay, so when people are new at something, they want to be told they're doing a good job. And when they're... Uh, experience, they want to be told how they can be better. So how experienced is she? How? Senior designer. Senior designer. Okay. Um, Nobody's filming this. Do not put it out there. They don't, they don't know them. <laughs> Theoretically, you have a senior designer that might need some It's guidance. basically she's overwhelmed and I'm like, why okay. is it not getting done faster? Right. Um, it, it's more of a sit down and figuring out what is overwhelming her uh, and then always try to do what they call the uh, uh, criticism sandwich which is something she's doing really well, something she can do better, and then give her the atta girl again. And then they receive that better because when you tell them the nice thing, all of a sudden they're listening. Okay. And then it's the, hey, you know what? You know what would really make this better is if you did that. Or the, what do you think? You know, giving, giving her that. Uh, but the overwhelmed, you know, some people, it, she's overwhelming herself. Yeah, and she gets super defensive. It's like when they're defensive, that's the question. It's like, right, and that's you why you have to do the sandwich. So you have to give her the good thing. Hey, wow, I really love what you did on that. You know, I was just thinking about this other project that you're doing, and I, I think we need to kick that up. You know, what, what do you think w would be a way to kick that up, right? And if she's like, well, I'm not really sure. He said, well, you know, I, I was thinking maybe something like that. Do you think that would work? And she'd go, okay, yeah, maybe. I said, we just remember you, we, that you really knocked it out of the park on that other thing. So give her the sandwich, and, and they receive it better. Because when you tell them something nice, all of a sudden they're all ears. Right? When you start criticizing, that's when they start to clam up. Yeah. And there are, uh, you know, listen, there's a time with some people where you can't change them. Um, I did a sales training, and there was, uh, everybody was paying attention, and this one woman is sitting there like this the whole time. Right, what's the body language, right? It could be that I'm cold, but it wasn't, <laughs> right? And I said to the boss, I said, what's with her? It was a dress shop. She said, she's our number two salesperson. She gets five-star reviews from all of our customers. I said, but she's not a team player. She said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, well, during the coffee break, she was by herself. Everybody else was talking with everybody else. Everybody else is paying attention and looking at everybody and taking notes. And she's like, I don't want to be here, right? It's what they call a lone wolf. And she said, do you think I could, I could train her different? I said, no. That's her personality, just who she is. We do have the negative Nellies. You do get those people, and you get the people that just overwhelm themselves, and some of them you can work through it, and some of you can't. But, you know, I always said to my people, if they're not getting it done, what am I not giving you? What am I not giving you that's preventing you from doing what you need to do? You know, what am I, what, why do you feel overwhelmed? What am I doing that's making you feel overwhelmed? Take it on yourself. And, and if they couldn't come up with any reason, well, hey, <laughs> maybe it's your turn to look in the mirror, not me. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, I'm Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Brett, and I'm having a six So, as you see, talking about the road to success. Oh, what is now? The road to success I love is that, clearly I love that road to smooth. success, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like spirals. It is. So when you hit those bumps in your road to success what do you do to pick yourself up because sometimes it's tough right you sit there and you go i'm not doing it again i can't do it i can't pick myself up again so what would you advice when you've hit that other bump and you're like you can do it actually one of the best today? things to do when you're feeling down is to go look at the reviews like that and it reminds you of why you do what you do because it, it's not because you just want to feel good hey i did a good job i'm affecting people's lives I'm, I'm touching people in a different way. And you're like, you know what? That's why I do what we do. Uh, I had a point in my business where I was, I was doing well, but I was pushing really hard. And my uncle said to me, pull back on your availability and let it come to you. And I just had to trust it. 
and I did. I, I, I wasn't making as many cold calls and stuff, and I was like, okay, if I've already done the work, I shouldn't have to do this, and I went up 40% the next year. And every time I feel like I'm pushing too much where it's disingenuous to me, I pull back. It's either got to be true to me or it's not. And then, it, when you call it what you want, universal energy or whatever, but when you're putting out that negativity, you're going to get that negativity back. And sometimes, again, just go read that stuff. Yeah. My thank you, by the way, what I do, I don't do it for the check and I don't do it for the words thank you. I do it for what's in the reviews. When people write things like that and they tell me, I got a call from, I got a Facebook message. We're packing to go to Disney because you told us we should raise our prices last year, and we did. And with the money, the extra money that we made, we're going with our family on holiday. That's my thank you. That's why I do what I do. Okay. Any more? One more over here. At the beginning, you spoke about, you know, you take somebody to the restaurant, you judge them by how they treat the help, essentially, yes. uh, or the person that's below them. That's sort of become customer service wisdom at this point. You pick up any book, that's what they tell you. Mm -hmm. So how do you distinguish when somebody's sitting there with you at the table doing the meeting and is super nice to everybody? You can't be with that person all the time. No. So how do you then look at it both from a, when you're in customer service, which we all are at the end mm -hmm. of the day, and when you're receiving, so, or somebody's pitching you, for example. Right. Like where do you figure out somebody is truly pleases and thank you because that's who they are and that's how they feel about the, the service that they're receiving, mm -hmm. or they're just doing lip service because that's what the book said? Well, they, they could be acting. They certainly could be acting. But I like to ask people, like, you know, again, what do you need that I'm not giving you? Or ask people, what do you think we should do in a situation like this? You know, what would you do? And then just see what their initial reaction is. Are they a, are they a people pleaser trying to, you know, just, you know, like a, like a dog, you know, you want to be petted? Or are they actually doing it from, from a different place? It's never a perfect science, but you know, I, I've definitely seen that myself. I've had people, like people would be really nice to me and I know that they were mean to my sales reps. I, I had somebody wrote to one of my sales reps, let me write this, let me, let me say this so your public school education can understand it. She, that's what she wrote to my sales, said to my sales rep. And then the person was very nice to me, right? But I knew what that had been there. I was like, all right, I know who you really are because I could never, <laughs> I could never think that about someone, no less write it to them or say it to them, right? And you know what? You don't, you don't do that to my people. And I, I'll, I've fired customers before and I will fire them again because my people are my family and I will take care of my people. And you, out. That's it. No, that's it. My people knew that. My people knew that, yeah. And you had a question here? Um, in one of my many hats, I work in, um, I work in a team of events. So. Um, we're normally paired the good with the bad and so on. Mm -hmm. um, last week we did an event with Paloma Faith and we had a sold out audience and the chair directed the last question and the person that was working opposite me had the mic and the chair asked her to go across and she literally went <laughs> into the mic and said to the person asking the question, well put your hand up then. How do you, you said in your talk, um, sit lead by example. She's been working with us for years now. We all lead by example. How do we affect a change in her? You have to point it out. A lot of people don't realize what they're doing. A lot of people don't realize their body language and, and, their, and the, what their words are because you're, you're doing what other people are doing, so you have to point it out. Just like a speaker that says um and er all the time. I have a good friend of mine. She's a fat, fantastic speaker, great content, and she says, um, 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 and after a while you're counting, right? 37, 38, 39, 40, because that's all you're hearing anymore. And I said to her, I said, I love your speeches, again, the sandwich, right? I said, I love your speeches, I love your contact, fantastic. I might suggest that you go listen to a recording, because you do say, um, you know, probably more than it should, and it can get in the way of the content, but again, I love, I love what you're talking about. And she called me the next day, she listened to the recording, and she's like, oh my freaking God, I cannot believe I say I'm that much, right? She just didn't realize it. So would you? She's been told many times about the way she interacts. You have video? Yeah. And you've shown her video? She watches them. Then don't put her on stage. <laughs> no, seriously. If she's representing your company, then don't put her on stage because she, there are some really nice people that should never be on stage. They, they just can't do that. They can't do what I do. I call it job security because they don't want my job, right? <laughs> there are a lot, you know, what they say, people would rather have dental work than be up here. I call that job security. If, if she doesn't represent your company well on stage like that, then tell her, listen, 
I need you to, I need you to pay more attention to that, or I can't have you on panels anymore. And I love your work, but that's not going to be part of your job. That's all, because she's representing you.